Today's episode of the Gold Cast is sponsored by the NFL Draft and the return of some semblance of sports. It is here, gentlemen. Thank God we finally have something to watch that is sports related, that is live sports related. Uh, Raymond, this episode is going to be all about the first round of the NFL draft with our special guest, Max Marsh. You guys know him. He's, he is a, a old school alumni of the Gold Cast. We haven't had him on for a while. That is not by choice. We're just all busy people. But he's going to be back as soon as we get the show started to talk all about 49ers and round one of the draft. But Raymond, why don't you let the crowd know where can they find us to give us our opinions on tomorrow's draft picks? You can always like us on facebook.com slash the gold cast, and you can follow us on Twitter at the underscore gold cast, and be sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Stitcher, all under the same moniker of the gold cast. Like, subscribe, and comment because we certainly want to get your take in this very special and very exciting pre draft preview. Yeah. All right, here we go. The greatest fanalist in the game. He is here. Your professor of fanalism. I'm in the building. Class is in session. Let's go. San Francisco, are you ready? This is the Gold Cast. Here we are. Boom. Welcome to another edition of the Gold Cast. We are the voice of the Bay. I'm your host, Rudy Salisa III. And with me is my brother, my co-host. Raymond Salisa I, baby. Boom. And our esteemed guest, he is a writer, director, actor, personal friend of mine here in Los Angeles. Welcome to the show, Max Marsh. What's up, buddy? Hey, thanks for having me on again. I thought you guys hated me. This is great. <laughs> it is excellent to have you back. You know, it's... Uh, it's always fun. It's it's. I actually am disappointed in the years that the Bears and the Niners don't play because, as we mentioned a couple years back, the last time you were on, those are the weirdest, strangest, and like what the fuck games of the season. And I always look forward to them. They're like the Halloween game, and they're never on Halloween. Oh yeah, it's amazing. I still one of my favorite football memories ever is that game where like the wind was blowing like crazy in Chicago, and no one knew how to kick. And so the ball was just flying around everywhere. I still remember that game all the time where, like, kicking a 30-yard field goal was basically, like, you know, fucking throwing an 80-yard touchdown pass with, you know, a Hail Mary at the last second. It was amazing. It was great. Absolutely. So, Max, you are a draft savant. You sit, you watch a lot of college tape let me ask you a question uh, just as somebody who doesn't watch a lot of college tape where do you find the time to watch college tape do you watch the, the whole college season like while you're watching the nfl season do you do it after do you do it in between where do you find the time to get to know all the draft players so in depth uh i think it's it stems a lot from enjoying the the college football game itself I watch a lot of college football. Uh, Saturdays to me are not the same as Sundays, but they're pretty close. I like having my Saturdays off where I can watch uh, a lot of college football. But, I mean, you know, there's something happening around lately that's been sort of, you know, keeping everybody inside. I don't really know what it is. And uh, I've just found a lot of time now to, you know, finally indulge. Because I've always had, like, stupid perspectives on, you know, guys that I've seen a lot of and I've watched a lot of. But this year, more than ever, I'm like, you know what? I got nothing but time. Let me look at what, you know, slot cornerback in the sixth round might be a great pickup. And I and, and so I've just been doing that like crazy those last like two, three months. That is super awesome. Now, before we before we go into this year's draft, we wanted to revisit the infamous 2017 NFL draft that involved the 49ers in the first round at the number two spot, the Chicago Bears sitting right there at number three. And at the time, we swapped picks. We swapped picks. For those who don't remember, we swapped. So we traded the Bears. We took their third. You got our second. And, and we drafted Solomon Thomas. And then you went and you drafted Mitch Trubisky. And so let's talk about that. Because, you know, last the last time we spoke, after, after Solomon Thomas... That this we ended up flipping that later on in the draft and ended up getting Reuben Foster and Solomon Thomas both in that round. 
right? And it looked like a pretty brilliant move for us. Uh, there was there was some criticism lobbied at the Chicago Bears for making that trade for Mitchell Trubisky. And now looking back, it doesn't really look like anybody won that trade. But let's talk about it from your perspective. Uh, re, re-familiarize the audience. What were your feelings at the time? And how do you feel about that trade today in 2020? I mean, I feel great. You know, I'm totally fine. Everything's great. Everything's going super well. I'm so happy. Uh, I couldn't be happier. And I thank you so much for bringing it up. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but really, uh, it, I don't think that. And it's, it's, uh, it's so upsetting because, I again, I was talking to you about this before. And I, I said this the last time when we did the, the cast so long ago. Is I was like, I don't mind moving up uh, in doing that whole process if what had happened was, you know, Lynch came to us and was like, hey, I know you guys, uh, we talked before, I know you guys want your quarterback, and someone's looking to trade up into the spot, and I think maybe perhaps they might be looking to take your quarterback. Uh, we, uh, and it's a great trade, it's hard, we can't say no to it because it makes our team better, and, you know, we, if we just move back one spot, we can guarantee that we get the guy that we want, and you guys can jump up and make sure that you get your quarterback, and I would feel way better and I could take way less than I would from them because I'm just moving back one spot. And so, you know, we said, sure. And I have no problem with that if what ended up happening was we drafted Deshaun Watson or Patrick Mahomes, but I wasn't in on Patrick Mahomes, so I wouldn't even have gotten that right. Uh, But instead, we drafted the Lobster Trabisk, and the rest of my life has now been devoid of joy. (laughs) Understandable. Well, you know, we're sitting there with those two picks, man, and Solomon Thomas and Reuben Foster – Reuben Foster, you know, obviously a lot of off the field issues, had off the field con- issues, concerns going into that draft, you know, had issues, had to be kicked out of the combine because of an altercation with the nurse. I mean, it was, you know, one thing after another with this guy. And then Solomon Thomas, you know, unfortunately has had some real intense personal issues, you know, uh, the the suicide of his sister, which was uh, obviously had a major toll on him emotionally, mentally, and has not really ever been able to capitalize. He also was playing out of position. And it really seems like even for us, you know, not a whole lot came of it. Raymond, what do you think about going back to that 2017 draft? What do you think looking back at all these moves made? What's your thoughts now that we're able to kind of have some perspective on it? I mean, in hindsight, it hasn't worked out very well at all. Uh, Room Foster had a lot of potential. Uh, he seemed pretty explosive and all over the place on the field, but he he seemed to get injured on every single play for some reason. He did, and and that trend, and now he like he, I think he tore his ACL in Washington, and he hasn't played for them, hasn't played a single snap, and you know so things just keep getting worse and worse for that kid. And I feel bad for him because I liked him in the interviews I saw with him. I thought he had you know uh, a nice you know uh, s- somewhat endearing personality knowing his background and how much he was excited to be a pro football player and to see him fall from the horse so hard it's uh it's kind of a tragedy in his case and Solomon Thomas too uh, although to not to the degree where you know because he seems like he had a good life growing up and had a very good head on his shoulders and was doing all the right things in college and then had this peripheral tragedy happen that affected him and whether that's one of the, I mean, it's obviously one of the contributing factors to, to why he's not panned out. But I also think that him trying to play a different position outside of what his skill set was coming out of college, that's never an easy thing for college players. I mean, I know Eric Armstead is, has been playing in position, but it took him like four or five years to finally break out. And, you know, obviously he was drafted way too high considering how long of a project he's been, including the first three years dealing with injury. But Solomon Thomas, yeah, Solomon Thomas is going through the same struggles three years into it. And now he's playing with, you know, he's like the last on the depth chart of that rotation group that comes in because of his inability to kind of pick up and and break through in this Robert Sala scheme, which is fairly simple schematically, but for some reason I, I just don't think he's quite, I don't. I, it seems like he would be a better fit as an outside linebacker in a three-four 
than playing inside in this uh, wide nine technique. But that's just me. I'm not uh, super deep in X and O's. We'd have to get Johnny Dells on here to see if he can shed some light on that. But uh, that's another episode. But yeah, I mean, in hindsight, it kind of sucks. But at the time, it was an awesome. It was an awesome. So it felt like a steal. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember what I said to you? Remember, remember what I said this to all of you uh, on that episode? It was like, was did we make the right decision? I told you guys I'd, I, I'll, I'll let you know in three years. And here we are three years later. And uh, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> and none of that's on. I mean, the good news is none of that's on John Lynch. I mean, John Lynch looked like a seasoned veteran in his very first draft. But, you know, the players just didn't pan out or uh, I mean, one of them could turn out to be an Eric Armstead and he could just be a late bloomer. So we don't know. So, the, you know, the jury's still out for Tom and Thomas. But as far as it being a overall number three pick, he has definitely not lived up to that at all, especially, you know, juxtaposed to a pick like Nick Bosa, which was a grand slam touchdown and slam dunk simultaneously <laughs> all three sports all three sports. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> all right so max let's go into this let's go in to the first round here we want to talk about the niners and then we also want to talk about your bears and seeing what they can do to upset the green bay packers and knock them off the hill so that we don't have to face them in the nfc championship again this year so starting with this 13th pick of the draft we have a couple major wide receivers and a couple defensive linemen that seem to be where everybody is leaning towards if these are the guys we're going to get at that position. So, of course, there's Jerry Judy from Alabama, Henry Ruggs from Alabama, CeeDee Lamb from Oklahoma, Brandon Ayuk, I think is how you say it, from Arizona. Those are our wide receivers. The defensive linemen that everyone's a big fans of is Javon Kinlaw from South Carolina, Derek Brown from Auburn, and I'm not even sure if I'm saying this guy is right. Yatur Gross Matos, is that right? Does that sound right? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's all pretty. It's all pretty, pretty close. Yeah, <laughs> close enough, right? So, they, looking at those wide receivers, which of them do you think fits that Shanahan scheme the most? He likes those versatile, speedy, physical guys. Yeah, and that's the thing is I feel like um, I feel like out of those three guys, they all give you uh, specifically a different aspect of that, which I think is really cool. I think C.D. Lamb is kind of like a uh, uh, a superhero Debo Samuel, where he's he's not necessarily uh, as quick, but he's a similar type of receiver, where he's a lot of yak yards, he's a lot of um, a lot of physicality, a lot of power, uh, pretty good route runner. Uh, Some people have him as the number one receiver, um, uh, but not necessarily always the number one guy going off. Uh, Then you got someone like Ruggs, who is uh, an Alabama receiver. So anytime you get a chance to draft an Alabama receiver, just do it. They're like Alabama guys, for some reason, are just can't miss prospects like all of the time. And he is unbelievably fast. He's like Marquise Goodwin if Marquise Goodwin stayed healthy ran unbelievable routes and uh, had sure hands. You know, he's like a complete receiver that just happens to be fast also. You know, John Ross, if he was a football player. And then you got someone who is my favorite, which is Jerry Judy, who is, uh, he's kind of in like the the A.J. Green and uh, uh, A.J. AJ Green and Julio Jones class, where they're kind of like a do-it-all receiver. They do everything, maybe not as fast as some of the other receivers are, but not slow by any means. Unbelievable route runner, um, uh, physical, uh, smart, and and I think he's the complete package. So in that situation, uh, for you guys, what I think would be great, which is something you don't have, is Judy, who I think is a surefire, absolute, guaranteed number one receiver in the way that all of us think about what a number one receiver is. Nice. What do you think about Brandon uh, Ayuk? I, uh, I, Brandon Ayuk, I think is, he's a little more difficult to read. It depends on, you know, uh, different people are looking at different receivers. Um, he wasn't really, a, a you know, a productive receiver last year. Uh, this year, the most recent season, uh, Nikhil Harry was his teammate, uh, the year before that. So Nikhil Harry kind of got, you know, most of the notice, but after Nikhil Harry left, went to the Patriots and then did absolutely nothing. Uh, then Ayuk was blowing up. He was a lot of run after the catch. 
he's fast, but he's not super fast. Uh, he's a little, he's a little bit physical, um, smart route runner, but I think he's one of those guys. It's a better fit at the very tail end of the first round or the beginning of the second round. If you're looking for a guy that's similar to that, uh, there's a receiver out of TCU, Jalen Ragor, who I think is Steve Smith. He's, he's classic Steve Smith. He's a badass. He squats more than linemen. He's super physical, unbelievable hands. Uh, he's, he's like, he's got Cortland Sutton. He's got, you know, Cortland Finnegan's personality where he's just a junkyard dog. And those guys are great to have. And he is an unbelievable jump ball receiver for guys like five ten. So I think he's like a super, a super power Brandon Ayuk, which is, you know, a guy that I would put a little bit ahead of Ayuk. Nice. Okay. So now let's, let's say we go the defensive route. And as I mentioned before, we've got Javon Kinlaw, Derek Brown, and uh, this name I'm butchering every time I think, Yatur Gross Matos. What are those? Tell me, let's start with Kinlaw and then work our way down. Uh, Kinlaw is a great story. Uh, Kinlaw had a lot of off the field issues. Um, originally early on his career, he came from a rough, uh, rough childhood, um, from South Carolina, uh, was, was, uh, was got better every single year, every single year he was there. He got better, uh, team captain. Um, uh, uh, he can play a lot of, he plays kind of like a hybrid D and D tackle technique, kind of, kind of like what you imagine most of the guys in the middle are for a uh, three, four, um, uh, super physical, can rush the edge, uh, can, can play good run defense. Um, he's, I think more than anything else, he's one of those unbelievable character guys and one of those unbelievable competitors that you want to have on your team. And he might not be as, uh, uh, as, as, as big as some of the other guys or as just purely talented as some of the other guys are. Um, but he is, um, he's one of those guys that's been linked to a lot of teams earlier than I think his grade is because he's one of those guys that people just want to get in their locker room. Uh, he's, he, it's not just his skill set, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's his personality as an athlete as well. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, he's very well liked I, from, from the things that I've read from other people and the things that, um, has come out about NFL GMs is there's a lot of people, you know, he's, he's one of those guys slotted to go in probably the, the perfect spot for him where would be somewhere like Atlanta or Denver would be like a perfect spot for him. So like right around where you guys pick actually is right about the perfect spot for him. But I've heard stuff from, uh, Carolina taking him. I've heard stuff a little bit earlier from people posting about it or, or people being people from Carolina that are reporters out there that are talking like they really like them. Uh, and, and, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that he is, he's not only a super talented guy, but he's also one of those guys that has such a, a, a high floor. And I think that his ceiling may not be as high as, as some of the other defenders you mentioned, but his floor is so high that, that it's one of those things where like, no matter what you get a guy that's going to be with your franchise for 10 years, and is going to bust his ass every time he gets out there and is going to find a way to make your squad better every single time. Moving on, let's go to Derek Brown from Auburn. Yeah, Derek Brown is uh is uh I mean in in a he's the best I think uh uh down lineman uh, on defense. He's absolutely he's he's just a stud. He's one of those guys that is like exactly what you think of when you think of a top 10 pick, he's a five-star athlete from, from high school came in, um, you know, has just been dominating people, uh, early on. He's more of what you guys are sort of looking for at that, uh, at that, you know, uh, no, like end tackle hybrid right there, big eater of people. Um, uh, uh, not necessarily, not necessarily a Supreme pass rusher yet, but it's a rough, it's a rough draft for like pass rushers. It's a rough draft for guys that are going to consistently rush the passer, but he's a guy that's going to eat up people. Um, he's, he's, he's not like a big fat guy or anything, but he can eat up people. He can eat up blocks uh, and he can get in, and he can stop the run. He can push back the pocket, create a pass rush for the rest of your rushing ends. Uh, I mean, I, I think that for me, if I was looking at a, at a tackle end, uh, something like you guys do in your three, four, uh, you know, I, I would feel unbelievably stoked if for some reason he felt you guys at 13, if you guys want to get him, I definitely think you're going to have to trade up. 
Ah, uh, so you think he's going to leave a little bit earlier? Yeah, I mean, if he's around, if he's around, you know, you have to be enamored with one of the receivers not to take him. Um, but I, I just think, I, I just think that for you, if any of the first three receivers that we talked about are there, you just can't pass it up. But, but Brown being there would be a, a revelation, and you would maybe even think about trading down because there might be people that are looking to trade up. Now, what about Gross Matos from Penn State? Uh, Gross Matos is one of those guys that's kind of uh, a uh, projection. He, it, it's not like he didn't do a good job. He was at Penn State, a uh, pass rusher, a, a little bit closer to uh, Chase on uh, that's also around there later that's, that's more of like a rusher. Um, he didn't produce nearly as much in college as you would have liked. Uh, he was another high recruit, somebody that came in. Uh, he's got a lot of measurables. He's a guy that did really well at the Combine. Uh, one of those guys, it's, it's a lot of a projection, um, but it's a good projection. It's a, proje- it's a projection of a guy that could come in and rush the passer uh, uh, opposite of Bosa or a guy to substitute in. I feel like that's what he would do originally is he would just sit there behind your super talented line uh, and get coached up by, by your defensive coordinator who is a fucking genius. And, uh, and I feel like, you know, if, if, if he gets time to sit behind people, that'd be great. But he, I think is also somebody that would be, a uh, someone to look at if you're trading down. All right, Raymond. Now, Raymond, why don't you walk him through our cornerbacks and O line, the guys that uh, that we that are possibly sitting around? Now, these guys they're saying might be around that thirty first pick if we keep the thirty first pick. So, Raymond, walk him through those guys. All right. So we definitely had some curiosity. And by the way, Max, that was a fantastic breakdown of those players. Man, you you have time. I wish I had to study these players my god (laughs) that's why we have you on max that's why you're here buddy (laughs) you need to come on every year for draft and every chicago tie-in that we can create for you because this is amazing stuff here all right so um starting off let me just give you the list and then i'll i'll rotate back to the top and we can go from there so i've got cj henderson from florida jeff okuda from ohio aj terrell from cleveland and christian fulton from lsu What's your take on CJ Henderson? And if you don't mind, I'd love to get pick your brain at the end of your breakdown to to if if you have an idea of what current pro or past pro that CJ Henderson compares to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so CJ Henderson is a uh, is is the number two cornerback. I would say uh, Okuda is a blue chip, absolute can't miss guy. Um, uh, but but. CJ Henderson is a, is a great get. He's, they're the only two cornerbacks that I truly think are 100% worth a first round grade. Uh, I think, I think CJ Henderson is a, is a little bit more of, um, uh, he was in Florida's defense. He's a little bit more of, uh, of, of a, of a specific defender. He's a guy that you can do a little bit of man with. Uh, Okuda can go play in anything. He's also a true shutdown corner. Now, what about now? The next two players are actually scheduled to, and and there's a couple different mock drafts of the 49ers where uh, experts believe that we're going to pick one of these two guys. The first is AJ Terrell, and the second is Christian Fulton. What is your take on Terrell? Uh, Terrell's been shooting up draft boards recently. I was hearing uh, in the last like two or three days that a lot of uh, NFL teams were like enamored by him and he came into the uh, college football playoff uh, as you know one of the top cornerbacks and then he he has pretty good tape like all of his tape pretty much is like yeah he's a he's a fringe first second round uh, uh, cornerback which especially in the world that we're in today in the NFL that position is there's there's this new debate now where what's more important pass rush or you know uh, uh, pass coverage and uh, their statistics are showing that it's definitely more pass coverage. And so I think that, you know, cornerbacks now will always get slightly more overvalued in the first round um, because we have all of these quarterbacks that are chucking the ball everywhere and we need someone to cover. So uh, AJ Terrell had one bad game in the most important game of his life, uh, the last championship game, and Ooh. he got burned everywhere. And uh, and that just stuck in people's minds. But the thing that people don't understand is that every single cornerback has a bad game and he had a bad game 
against Alabama and three receivers, two receivers that are going in the first 15 picks. So I feel like there's a little bit of forgiveness there. Not that it excuses anything that he did, but I think he's he's a he's he's a good cover corner. Uh, he can play a little bit of zone. He can play a little bit of man. He's not necessarily super physical, um, but he's physical enough. He's a guy that I would be comfortable with um, if you're looking for a cornerback at the tail end of the first round, second round. Uh, right around there is uh, the sweet spot for cornerbacks. Okay, and then what about Christian Fulton out of LSU? Uh, Christian Fulton out of LSU. Uh, he shared the backfield with uh, Grant Delpit. Uh, Grant Delpit is a safety, uh, and uh, they th- both of them are unbelievable physical talents. Uh, there's a lot there to like. Um, Fulton had a lot of off the field stuff, which I think is kind of pushing people away. But then I saw earlier, like a couple weeks ago that, you know, he was the clearly the third rated cornerback. Um, but so obviously the off the field stuff didn't matter, but then I've started seeing more stuff about Terrell popping up. Um, Fulton is a, uh, he, he's, he lacks physical, physical cover corner, um, skills. Uh, he's got the makings of being able to do that. He's, uh, he's, pretty good in zone coverage. I mean, it's LSU. That's the one thing about LSU is anytime you're taking an LSU defensive back, it's like Ohio state and pass rushers. You know, you know that a, a second round LSU cornerback or safety is going to be better than a second round, you know, uh, Virginia tech cornerback or safety. Their, their coaching there is excellent. Um, and again, he's a blue, ch- he's, he's a blue chip physical talent. Uh, it just depends on, you know, what you surround them with. And I think that's a lot of the issues with some of these um, offenses and defenses like Alabama and LSU that are surrounded by blue chip talent is they don't have a lot. They, they have a lot of room to just do exactly what they're supposed to do. And it works out, you know, and I think sometimes that can be an issue and sometimes they can be like, oh, cool. And they also play with Joe Burrow. So last year, LSU defensively kind of was slightly disappointing and uh, uh, Fulton did a good job, uh, but I think that a lot of it was overshadowed by how good their offense was. And I think that, you know, there's there's still three guys that are potential first round picks coming out of that LSU defense. And uh, and I think Fulton is is a is a safe bet to be a first round pick. I honestly would feel more comfortable with Fulton than uh, uh, than Terrell, um, just because I feel like Terrell just showing that inconsistency. Um, against t- high level talent, whereas Fulton, pretty much all of his stuff is correctable. All of his coverage is correctable. He's just got to learn. He's just, you know, people question sometimes his, um, his, his, his willingness and his desire. And, and so I think all you really have to do is get a coach that can teach him how to do stuff, uh, can, can teach him a little bit better of the specifics of things. And I think that he's a sculptable piece, whereas I don't know if Terrell necessarily has that amount of physical talent. Gotcha. All right, let's move on to offensive linemen. Now, this is a position where, you know, Joe Staley's on the cusp of retirement. He signed a two-year deal a year ago or just before last season, so he made it to the Super Bowl in that first year, albeit injured most of the regular season and did miss some time in the Super Bowl itself. So I know the Niners are going to be looking for offensive linemen perhaps to just add some depth for the eventual retirement of Joe Staley. So our list here is Mecky Becton out of Louisville, Andrew Thomas out of Georgia, Jedrick Wilson Jr. out of Alabama, and Ezra Cleveland out of Boise. Now, out of all those four players, Ezra Cleveland ended up on a mock draft as a selection for the 49ers. Let me start there. What's your take on Cleveland? Ezra Cleveland is, uh, is, a, good, is a very good pass blocker. He's very athletic. Um, he's, uh, a a little small in terms of, uh, physical mass. Uh, he's a tall, he's a tall tackle. Um, and he needs to improve physically as, as a run blocker, but he's a great pass blocker. And there's a lot there to like, um, I think Ezra Cleveland is probably a better fit for the tail end of the first round turn of the second round. That's where he, apparently that's where he's slated to land according to a couple of different drafts. And so what about um, what about Jedrick Wilson Jr. out of Alabama? 
Oh, Jedrick Wills is, uh, I think, my favorite overall tackle in the draft. He is listed as a right tackle, um, but he was on uh, two as, uh, but two as a left-handed quarterback. So his right tackle is a left tackle. And I think somehow people are getting confused by that. Uh, so naturally, he has played on the right-hand side, but he is a blindside blocker. So in, in my estimation and how I feel about it is he both knows how to be on the right side, uh, which is great if you want him to be a right tackle, but he also knows how to be a blindside blocker and what to do when the premier pass rusher is on his side. Uh, I, I love Jedrick Wills. I think that he's the complete package. I think that there are other people that have higher upside, um, but not much higher. And I think his, I think his, his floor is very high as well. Um, and you know, he's, he's, again, it's an Alabama tackle, the same thing, Alabama tackles, Alabama offensive linemen are just studs. And he came in, um, high, 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 uh, high stars, blue, very blue chip talent out of high school. And, uh, and I, I, he's my favorite tackle. I can't imagine if he's available at 13, uh, and thinking about it for you guys. Um, I think that somebody like that would be a hard person to pass up if he fell down to you guys at 13. Yeah, I think uh, the the latest mock picked Ezra Cleveland because they believe, assuming that the Niners keep their first round pick at number 31, that they would take Cleveland, which is right around the area you believe he will go in tail end of the first or uh, the beginning of the second. So that seems to fit that bill. And I believe uh, he was picked for the Niners just because he's a good scheme fit. I know Kyle Shanahan runs a very complicated pre-snap motion run scheme that's state-of-the-art and definitely, in in my opinion, the best in the NFL, despite uh, the Ravens uh, totaling more rushing yards in total. I think nothing was more sophisticated than the Niners running game. All right, how about Andrew Thomas out of Georgia? Andrew Thomas uh, is a uh, is another right tackle, uh, but he is a legitimate uh, right tackle. He's uh, he's very he's he's a he's a powerhouse. Um, he's definitely going to be somebody that you want to keep on the right hand side. Great run blocker. Um, you can definitely move him to the left hand side. He's there are sometimes, especially in the top part of the draft, even the right tackles that you get are skilled enough to be able to shift over to the left hand side. Uh, I've been hearing a, a lot um, on places that I've read and um, and and people that I've talked to that are saying that he could actually end up being the first tackle taken, which I think is is weird to think it's a little high because I think that. You know, there's four tackles that you could take in the first 10 picks and you could, you know, every team could tell me a way why they picked them. And I'd be like, totally buy it. Done. Got it. You're, you're in. Um, but him being the first seems a little strange. Um, I feel like it's it's an uh, it's a it's a weird thing to overvalue uh, a right tackle when you have a left tackle available, unless there's something in him that you see that can be a pass blocker. And he's an athlete. He's an athlete, but he's a big, thick guy. And then you see other guys that are, you know, better athletes that are available there. So just, you know, I, I think that if you need to work on your running game or you have a hole at right tackle specifically and you have your left tackle locked up, uh, Thomas is a great, great pick. There's also the general belief that when Staley retires that McGlinchey uh, may move over, you know, because he originally was a left tackle and then has been at the right. And that's kind of been... That was the general consensus when he was first drafted that McGlinchey would move over and would become the left tackle and replace Staley once Staley was ready to retire. You know, you heard that a lot going around the 49er camp. Yeah, I think and, and that makes sense. I mean, I feel like that's that's usually the best way to sort of um, to sort of induct uh, a tackle to into it. I, I know there's a lot of times where uh, teams will draft the left tackle and put them on the right hand side. And then have him learn over there because, you know, again, as, as someone that was a lineman themselves at one point, uh, you know, there's a lot made about what it's like to kick back with your left leg versus what it's like to kick back with your right leg. And sure, there's a little bit of growing pains, but like that's the smallest difference that there could possibly be in any blocking at all. And so I feel like as long as you get him into similar schemes and you get him understanding what your scheme is trying to do, sure it's the right-hand side versus the left-hand side, but it's still getting him reps, it's getting him experience and, you know, I think that that's probably a smart way to do it. You guys have a good tackle situation going on, so, you know, I feel like getting somebody in, maybe not necessarily a top-tier 
talent. I, that's why I think that if you do keep your uh, 31st pick, there is a potential of having good guys slide down to you that are developmental guys with a higher upside, um, but are kind of projects. And that's a perfect opportunity for this season to have them sit, be maybe a swing tackle, maybe not even see the field. Then next season, get a chance at right tackle. And then as time goes on, maybe they shift over to left tackle. I think that's not a bad route to take. Awesome stuff, man. This is uh, this is fire. All right, and then how about uh, the the top prospect that is believed to be uh, in the out of the offensive line class, Mecky Becton out of Louisville. Yeah, Becton, uh, Becton, and uh, there's another tackle, Werfs, that are both these unbelievable physical specimens. Um, uh, uh, Becton was a right tackle for most of his college career until this last season when he shifted over to left tackle. He's 360 pounds, six, seven, six, eight, I think. And he, uh, he ran like a five, one forty, which is like the fastest 40 time ever run by a guy over like 350 pounds by like a lot. Um, and he, uh, he's, he's a physical specimen. Uh, he's another one of those guys that uh, has maybe a little bit uh, lower of a floor. His floor is a little bit lower. There's a chance that he can bust, but his ceiling is unbelievably high as such a freak physical athlete like that to protect the, the backside or even, you know, the right hand side um, is impressive. His arms are huge. He's extremely physically gifted. Uh, his strength is unbelievable. Uh, he's another one of those guys that had pretty good production, but is also a, a lot of it is a projection on what he could be. And so it's one of those um, talents that I feel like uh, I feel like of all of the tackles that you talked about, I think he's probably the most likely to be there at 13. Um, because I think that, again, people have some of the similar questions of is, you know, how high is his bust potential? Are we willing to take a risk when we have some more, you know, uh, uh, we have prospects that are, you know, a little bit easier to project some guys that are a little bit uh, a, a little bit less of a um, bust uh, factor. And I feel like for for Becton, he's he's one of those guys that I feel like when you if you hit a home run with him, you know, he's a Hall of Fame guy. He, he really is just uh, just a sort of a, a one of one. You know, there's he's a unicorn. There's not there. They don't make people like that. And uh, and I feel like that's also a guy that at 13 would be an interesting choice for you guys to sit him behind for a year, shift him over to right tackle, have a six, eight right tackle bowling people over. There's a great video of him pushing a guy out of bounds like full on like it's a, a sports comedy where he's just blocking a guy from the middle of the field to out of bounds to the whistle and he's just one of those guys that you know if he can do that in the nfl is a terrifying lineman to have on your side wow that sounds like uh he sounds even more menacing than trent brown who the niners had who was also six eight three hundred plus that then got flipped over to new england and ended up playing becoming a pro bowler there but i, th- I don't think he plays for new england anymore i think he got moved again uh after that yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe you're right. Yeah, he went to Oakland. Or, sorry, Las Vegas. Vegas, get it right. <laughs> Vegas. Let me ask you a question. Of of the D linemen that we talked about, Kinlaw, Brown, and Gross Matos, do any of them have a skill set that you feel is similar to DeForest Buckner? Or or are we just screwed in that category now that he's gone? Like is the, and if there isn't someone on that on that short list, is there anybody you can think of that is in the draft that could possibly replace DeForest Buckner either at thirteen or at thirty one? I mean, I feel like Brown's the only one that I feel like could, you know, is 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 close to that. Uh, but I feel like it's it's hard. Like again, I mean, I I I think one hundred percent that you guys won that trade. It's hard losing to Forrest Buckner, but you know, the cap is an unbelievable animal that none of us will ever understand unless we spend thousands of more hours than I've spent watching fucking videos online, you know, to try and understand it's a ridiculous concept. Uh, but you know, it makes sense. Like, you know, even if you get a guy that is, you know, three quarters of what Buckner was, but you're paying him, you know, one tenth of what you guys would be paying him for four years that's a that's a trade I do, you know, in a heartbeat as a fan. You hate it because you want to see all your guys stay when you have a guy that's a game breaker like that. But I feel like someone like Brown would probably be um, the closest. 
but I also feel like there's more pressing needs. And I feel like later on in the draft, you can, you know, find some guys that are more serviceable and might be, you know, a quarter of what he was, but cost infinitely less or, you know, keep, I know your defensive coordinator is a smart enough guy to be able to find a way around losing to force Buckner. They wouldn't have traded him so quickly if he didn't know a way that he could utilize the guys that you have with maybe a few extra little, you know, Swiss army knives to throw in there to make it better. And I feel like maybe that comes from, uh, you know, more of a linebacker pass rush Maybe it comes from shifting guys in and out. Maybe it comes from formations on the line, you know, ends, tackles, uh, uh, rushers, switching back and forth. There's a way to manufacture it, but, you know, it's it's hard losing a piece like that. Absolutely. Uh, Raymond, do you have any more questions for him about the Niners before we move on to his Bears? That was pretty much it. That was absolutely perfect. Awesome. All right, so moving on, let's get to the big question how close do you feel the Bears are to upseating the Packers? You know, they obviously, they switched coaches. Their defense got a lot better. Got them to the NFC Championship, but fell really short. You know, Aaron Rodgers famously saying that uh, the 49ers were going to regret this decision. And pretty much any time we've had a team over 500, I've yet to regret it. So how do we get you guys in the place of the Green Bay Packers and we get some weird... Uh, Chicago, San Francisco playoff games that no one, no one can explain and inexplicably go down in the history books as you know some of the weirdest playoff games of all time. How do we make this happen? Man, we just got to get a quarterback that can complete passes. That's it. Seems like such a simple solution, uh, but I watched NFC North games last year and it was legitimately a defense stopping an offense, and then the offense going on the field three and out. And then a defense holding an offense to a field goal. And then we come on the field in a three and out. And then we stop them again. And then we get another three and out. And, and, and then it just gets exhausting after a while watching that. And seeing a game like the first game of the season where, you know, the Packers beat us on one play. They beat us on one play defensively. And when you lose on one play defensively in a game that's, you know, a, a total, if you combine the scores under 25 points, you know, that's not on the defense. That's not on the defense. That's on the offense being able to produce something. And I feel like that's why people can shit on the Nick Foles trade that happened. But, you know, what I am hopeful for is having a quarterback that maybe that isn't going to have a high ceiling. He's not going to win an MVP. He's not going to throw for 5,000 yards and 50 touchdown passes. I'll take not turning the ball over and hitting open receivers on third down. That's what I'll take. It seems so simple. I, I think our defense uh, sadly will probably be slightly worse this year, depending, you know, pending on some insane, uh, draft pick in the second round, you know, if Antoine Winfield falls to us and then he's our, you know, sick, nasty, strong safety slot corner hybrid. That's, you know, walking around and making some crazy plays. Sure. Great. If we have one of the top corners fall to us. Awesome. Great. Make our defense unbelievable. I still think we'll have a top 15, top 10 defense, you know, probably closer to the top 10, maybe inside. Um, but I think that what it really comes down to is if our offense can be in the middle of the pack, that's all it takes. I think that's all it takes. I don't think the Packers are very good. Uh, I think the Packers coasted last year off the fact that they had to play our terrible quarterback situation twice. And, uh, and they had some big breaks. They're going to have, you know, they're going to have some regression in certain areas. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily know if I buy LaFleur as a head coach. I don't think so. Uh, and, uh, and there's always a sophomore coach slump feels like it's constantly happening. There's always, you know, this second season is going to be the season and then everything explodes. And then, you know, it, it's just like the sophomore quarterback issue. Um, but you know, I think that the Packers didn't get better and I, you know, you could argue that we didn't get better, but I truly believe that by adding a quarterback to complete passes or finding a way to get Mitch Trubisky to complete passes is the key to beating the Packers. I'm not worried about the Vikings. I'm not worried about the Lions. I'm kind of worried about Aaron Rodgers and only Aaron Rodgers. I think that's fair. I think he's earned that spot. Do you guys draft a quarterback? Man, uh, I think that I think that it's a little early to draft a quarterback um, because I think that 
if you're in a position where drafting a quarterback this draft is a necessary thing, you're going to be finishing at the bottom at the bottom of the NFL anyway this season. So you may as well wait until the next draft and get a higher a higher talent quarterback than what you'd be getting. Uh, there's some quarterbacks in the second round ish that I like. Uh, that would be fun to have. Maybe not necessarily somebody, you know, like Jalen Hurts is one of those guys that, uh, you know, in terms of tape, I don't love. But as like a player to watch that I enjoy watching, I love him. I think he's great. I think he's like, you know, in like a way less accurate to Sean Watson. He's just a gamer. He's just a winner, but he's just not accurate. Uh, and And that's a guy that I would love to root for, but not necessarily, you know, a guy that you take up and pick. We could take a quarterback uh, fifth, sixth round at the end of the draft. There's some experimental guys. Uh, Gordon out of Washington State. Uh, after this is over, everybody and you two, just go watch some of his tape. He's like he's like Gunner. He's like, you know, a Gardner Minshew just took a bunch of crack and is just like losing his mind. He's a blast to watch. I don't necessarily know if like he's going to be anything, but I he's like Gardner Minshew. He's one of those guys where you're like, oh, fuck it. I, this guy's my quarterback. Awesome. You know, uh, and then there's uh, there's another Gordon at uh, Florida uh, International Lane Kiffin's quarterback. Uh, another fun guy. Uh, McDonald at Hawaii uh, is another one of those. Those are those are all like YOLO quarterbacks. Those are all quarterbacks where like you'll watch their tape and you're like, wow, there's some unbelievably terrible throws in this. And then you'll see one throw. You're like, wow. I, I can't I don't think I've ever seen a quarterback make that throw. And then you'll see another 18 terrible passes. And you're like, all right, cool. Great. Never mind. But I think those are fun guys to add at the at the tail end of a draft. And uh, and and so, you know, maybe we'll take something like that. Pace has always said that, you know, he'd like to find a way to draft a quarterback every draft and has done it literally once in his first year. So I don't know. Um, it would be fun to take a late round quarterback that I'm stoked on. But who knows? Yeah, I think uh, if I was in your position, Max, I'd be questionable for Matt LaFleur. I feel like he's a derivative of Kyle Shanahan. And obviously that proved to be the case when they were matched up against one another. I think Sean McVay matches up a little bit better, although you, we can see that when he is lacking the talent that the Rams are lacking right now because they bet all of their chips in that one Super Bowl loss that they went to, and now they're paying for it dearly, or I guess not so much with the lack of cash that they possess or don't possess. And so they're only good enough to maybe get one good series in the first quarter, which seemed to be the case in both games, although they did they were more competitive in that second contest. But yeah, I think uh, anyone that comes out of the Kyle Shanahan coaching tree, they need a lot more time in the oven if they want to become, I think, elite coaches, which was the case with a lot of the coaches that came out of the Bill Walsh tree uh, for good reason. And um, and it wasn't till towards the end when those car coaches started to come out of him, like Mike Holmgren and and or, uh, Mike Shanahan. But uh, but yeah, I think um, I think you guys, if you guys just reignite that offense, you'll be in a, a good position. And then hopefully we get to play play you. Uh, I think the last time was 2017, which is an all field goal game by uh robbie gold the former bear oh robbie oh robbie that's another thing i miss robbie i miss robbie i miss robbie so much he's my favorite he went to my mom's bar one time uh he tipped her she's like do you know who robbie gold is he is my favorite guy he's so sweet he's so cute and he is also my favorite guy uh i think i want to marry robbie gold i don't know uh chicago <laughs> will always love robbie gold and I don't think uh, Niner fans will ever understand how much we wanted him to be released and then sent to us. He would that was that was the number one love. We you know it's a misconnection. We'll never have it back. He has a house out there. I can't. I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> bittersweet, bittersweet, bittersweet. Well, we love him, but probably not the way you guys do. But that's definitely, uh, yeah. We you know we clamped him down for. For three years here, and I don't, I don't see them giving up him up any time soon. Uh, Max, thank you so much for coming on the show. That was bad ass. Uh, best of luck to the Bears and the draft tomorrow. And I'm sure you and I will be texting back and forth on our league uh, group text and just chatting about all the insane moves because uh, I think the Niners going to make a couple crazy moves, and there's always some crazy moves. So I, I really look forward to, to tomorrow. It's going to be great. Yeah, dude, I'm super excited. And uh, just so you know, uh, the 31st pick 
If anybody falls to you that I need, I am expecting you to personally contact Lynch and let him know that I would like to trade up and I would like him to give me a break and maybe, you know, be a little lenient on us for just giving him a fifth round pick in a second. Okay. (laughs) You know what? Done deal. I got you. You know, we have Shanahan and Lynch on speed dial. They never answer our calls, but we call them all the time. So for sure. Uh, so concludes another edition of the Gold Cast. We are the voice of the Bay. I'm your host, Rudy Salise III, and with me is my brother, my co-host. Raymond Salise the first, baby. Boom! We'll see you next time. Same Gold Cast time, same Gold Cast channel. This is, is the Gold Cast. 